Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. On tonight's program, we invite back a former guest who's joined us twice before, right? That's right. It's good to have Dr. Stephen Smith back, former non-denominational evangelical. Uh, we're going to talk about it, but he would represent one of those that's in one of these big mega churches. That's the, the, the tradition you were coming out of, right? right? right. Um, he's author of a book called The Word of the Lord, Essential Principles for Catholic Scripture Study. We might talk a little bit about that, but that's really an important thing, so it's good. In some ways, that represents the continuity of your journey yeah. after becoming a Catholic. So first of all, Stephen, it's welcome Catching back, back to the Marcus. journey home. Yeah. It's, it's good to have you here. Yeah. Maybe right off the, at the bat, tell the, the folk what you've been doing since the last time you've joined uh, us on the program. It's been kind of a whirlwind. I'm trying to remember what, what year that was, but it's been a few years now. Um, so I teach full-time at Mount St. Mary's Seminary. Yeah. Been open just a few years, 1808, when they opened their doors. Uh, and we have um, men discerning for the Catholic priesthood from about 25 dioceses across the United yeah. States. So it's a, it's a great joy, great responsibility to be with these men in discernment for either six or four years, depending upon how long they're they're with us. I think, I might be wrong on this, but uh, I think some of the Franciscan brothers from EWTN Yeah, we, have, we do, we do. Yep. That's right. We started a few uh, more last year. Of course, not us or their bishops, but absolutely. Right. Yep, so. right. Well, that's good. Yeah. Well, it's good to have you back. And what I like to do when we have a returning guest, and just in case someone watching the, the program didn't, see your first appearance or it's like me can't always remember all of them yeah give a, a summary of yeah. what it is that uh, brought you into the church uh, and make sure you help them understand that jesus was a part of the journey that's yeah. right yeah big part <laughs> yeah snapshot well um again it's good to be back with you i uh, and a clarification i should uh, remind for those who have seen uh, me tell the story before, and, and for those who are new to this, I actually grew up Catholic, because I grew up in a Catholic home, so in many ways fit that model of a, a revert right. to the faith, yeah. Um, grew up in a very loving, moral Catholic home uh, in Chicago, and my neighborhood was, I would say, predominantly Irish Catholic. So there was kind of that ethos in the neighborhood. You'd go to church on Sunday, uh, you know, we said grace before meals, uh, my, my parents certainly were loving and faithful in the sense of going to church and taking us there. And, but we didn't really talk about the faith. I remember, you know, we'd often walk home to our, uh, from our neighborhood parish, and everyone was always talking about, well, the bears are on today, you know, what the bears, you know, that was kind of very, very common. So I saw growing up, looking back, a disconnect between, you know, we went to Mass, we prayed, and then you kind of left it behind on Sunday morning and got to the business of your life. Um, at some point in time for me in high school years, the questions began to arose. You know, what, what is uh, the value of going to church? And I, I found myself wanting to, in that push and pull with my parents of not wanting to go. I found it, you know, boring and irrelevant and this kind of thing. And so at some point I did have a falling out completely where I broke from going to Mass and really considered myself agnostic and I'm just going to be kind of open to all different kinds of truths. Never really settled on any kind of philosophy or anything, kind of drifted along. And in my early years in college, um, had a very uh, dynamic experience with some Protestant missionaries on the, on the college campus. And over a period of months, they kind of worked on me and, you know, I said the sinner's prayer and, <laughs> and soon joined a small brethren church. I don't know if I mentioned this last time on the program. Um, it was with the um, Plymouth Brethren uh, community okay. for uh, a short period of time, less than a year. Um, and one of the things I learned was really what I call the ABCs of Bible study from them. Right. It was very, very simple stuff. Uh, they don't have pastors, they have elders, you know and kind of a vestige of the American Puritanism stuff, right? But he said, let me teach you the ABCs of Bible study. And we open a passage and he said, okay, well, t give me your first impressions. That was A, first impressions. What do you think? What do you feel? And so on. B was, if I'm remembering correctly now on the spot, a big idea. What was the big idea of the passage, right? So wedding feast at Cana, well, Jesus did this miracle. C, what challenges you in this passage? And D, I think, was what's difficult. Then he would try to fill in with his knowledge, you know, and he went to seminary to help with those things. So A, B, Cs, and Ds of Bible study. The problem was that um, I was probably the only person that I knew in the church who was under the age of 70. <laughs> and I'm exaggerating slightly, but it was a wonderful community of older folks. And there was a few younger you know, people there. Um, one Sunday morning, there was a couple that had visited and uh, was uh, friends of, I think, one of the elders, you know. 
and I got to know them. I said, well, where do you guys go to church? And they said, well, we go to Willow Creek out in South Barrington, one of the far-flung Chicago suburbs. Said, What's that? And boy, as they told me about it, I thought, that's where I've got to go. <laughs> and it wasn't soon after that conversation that I was heading out to Willow Creek. And at first, when I drove onto the campus, I thought, you know, I must have missed the church. I think this is the Motorola campus because there was no <laughs> steeple, no cross, no signs of church. And walking in only confirmed that. It really felt like an expansive auditorium and um, uh, corridors that would resemble, you know, kind of a high tech uh, corporation, beautiful campus layout, fountains outside, but no a uh, real vestige of church. So it intrigued me. What kind of church is this? Uh, I don't see the stained glass windows. There's no altar. There's no cross. There's no kneelers. Um, the sanctuary, if you want to call it that, uh, place where we met, was really much more like your modern auditorium with a stage, video screens. Um, and then very briefly, what the service was like was kind of a combination of a, uh, a rock concert and a drama uh, and a long Bible message all rolled up into one. Yeah. And I have to say, it was entertaining. Yeah. It's not why we go to church, right? But it, there was the sense that you came up, you know, like if you had gone to a good movie or a good theater, and you'd say, you know, this is very uh, entertaining and gave me a lot to think about. Um, I was at the church for about seven, eight years before I ultimately made my way back to the Catholic faith, came back into the church in 2000. So mm -hmm. I was there in the mid-90s, met a lot of wonderful people. In fact, I... Uh, one in particular I met I liked so much, I married her, brought her back to uh, <laughs> home. Her name is Elizabeth, and she was also a wayward Catholic who had found herself at this mega church, seeker church as it's mm -hmm. called, uh, with me. And six months before we're married, we're sitting on a park bench, we're engaged, and she said, Steve, do you think you'd ever want to go back to the Catholic church? And I said, no, it's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. So here we are 13 years <laughs> later, we've got two children, and um, we came back into the church in 2000, went on to get a uh, uh, master's degree from Wheaton College in uh, theology, and then a PhD from Loyola University of Chicago, New Testament. So uh, teach at Mount St. Mary's full time, and I uh, have a teaching ministry beyond uh, the walls of the seminary with the book yep. and speaking and so yep. on. And, if you were to look back on, yeah. uh, without going through the whole the rest yeah. of the whole journey, maybe the one issue, what was the one key issue that hit you on the side of the head and, and uh, gave you the, the, the mandate, yeah. the conviction to come home to the Catholic Church? I wanted to know what the early church really was all about. Willow Creek had a, uh, a motto, in fact, it's a scripture, and I can, I can read it for us. And they said, this is where we're gonna take our stand. This is what we're gonna be all about. It's from Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter. Uh, verse 42 says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And that became really, for me, uh, the, the life force of what I wanted to follow. But it was shot through the lens of this 20th century, very contemporary evangelical church. For so them, had, the breaking of bread would have been fellowship. Fellowship, yeah. A and, you know, so they had, uh, not Eucharist, they had Lord's Supper once a month right. as a memorial. You know, not the real presence, but as this remembering. And so for me, seeing this experience of, you know, 10,000 people in an auditorium. They'd do these baptisms every May where they'd get 500 people and they'd baptize them in the river outside. And it seemed sort of an uh, epic, almost biblical proportions. So something in the emotions seemed to connect with what seemed to be this spectacular passage in Acts. And it seemed to kind of correlate. You know, so maybe we are kind of living out this Acts 2 church in the as Jesus would have intended it in the 20th century. Of course, I, underneath that surface, I had no bearing of what actually happened from the time of you know, the apostles, the successors to the apostles, all the way through the ancient, medieval, modern, contemporary Catholic Church. Well, I'm so I had assuming, to rediscover it. I'm assuming that having, when I went to seminary, Protestant, not, my assumption was this idea of going out and starting your own, planting your own church, was not a negative at all. Um, it was a, 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 it was a way of expanding the message, right. of going into areas, as Paul would say, I'm not going to build on somebody else's foundation. I'm right. gonna, there's a whole area out here where no one's being fed, and I'm going to go there and feed, so I'll start a house church. And the we, only obstacle was courage. Do you have the courage? Do you, you, if you feel God's calling you, you by George, you get up and do it. I mean, you get a few friends to come with you. You, 
yeah. you know, get some pledges and some donations and and yeah. you go off and do it. Yeah. And the idea of, well, or I could go be in a denomination, but there was this struggle because, okay, if I'm in that denomination, I've got to deal with that leadership and their priorities and their ways of doing things. And, and so I think when I was in seminary, there was a tension there. Do I stick with the old denominations or do we do these new ones? And it was during that time that Bill Hybels and others was right. just starting these churches. Now we've so far come the other direction. Right. That in a way, Bill Hybels in that thing is almost the old model. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, it's some of these churches you go online and there's no connection with traditional Christianity. And you look at their whole leadership, they're all under 30, right. if, if not under 25. Right. And 25,000 people in there. And I've joked on the program before, it used to be that the sign when you walked in the church said, no food or drinks allowed. Mm -hmm. Now the sign is make sure it's got a cover on. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. The Starbucks bar out in the lobby and so on, yeah. Actually, the, the new uh, auditorium at Willow Creek, I mean, just on a purely uh, architectural level, it's, I mean, they got all the high-tech, you know, video stuff and camp escalators and, but again, it, you know, what's, what's not present there, aside from the, the real present, is the sense that of that classical idea of beauty. You know, but that's another another conversation. Right. But I think for me, um, I, I really saw a correlation between this spectacular book, Acts of the Apostles, and dramatic faith and strength, and what seemed to be happening before my eyes. But then I decided, and this is where it gets uh, always interesting, to get a master's degree and do some more study, go back and look at the text of scripture and also church history, and so that I'd be a suitable candidate to work full time in ministry at the church. Well, little did I know what was going to happen. <laughs> One of the questions that came up, Marcus, was actually, well, what is Sunday? What is Sunday all about? Um, it's interesting because at Willow Creek and a lot of so-called seeker churches, they've moved away from the model of the traditional Sunday service. And you say, well, why would they do that? And it gets to the question of, well, who are we really trying to, what is our purpose? And Willow Creek and other uh, evangelical churches often see their purpose as getting people saved, right? Getting people yep. into the point of conversion. And so if that is the, um, what it's all about, then everything else is negotiable, even yep. Sunday service. So uh, I, in pursuing my master's degree at Wheaton College, home of Billy Graham, um, I began reading, for example, Justin Martyr, who says, you know, we met at dawn on the Lord's Day on Sunday. You know, and we read from the memoirs of the apostles, and then he goes in and describes, you know, basically the first, you know, the early mass and the Eucharist and so on. We'll set aside for a moment the issue of the Holy Eucharist and all of that, yep. and just deal with, well, why did we feel free to change this long continuity? And it wasn't just Justin Martyr, right? It's just right. reflected all through the tradition. Why do we feel free to change that, and on what basis? So questions started to emerge very quickly when they actually thought about it, stepped out of the emotion and the experience of all this drama, and just give it some thought, you know, put it to the test of reason and also history, and began to see disconnections between what we, as this church, were claiming was an Acts 2 20th century experience and the actual early church. There was a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And then I began to see other disconnects. For example, why don't we baptize our children? I remember when I was at the church, someone said, you're invited to a baby dedication this, this weekend. I thought, okay, well, what exactly is a baby dedication? <laughs> and um, I soon saw, you know, met the parents and, you know, we read some scripture. We may have read uh, from Luke 2, Jesus' presentation in the temple, or I forget what. But it, there was a moment where the parents recognized, well, we're not Catholic, so we're not going to certainly baptize. We don't believe in sanctifying grace through baptism. But we don't want to let this moment pass by. We want the child to grow up to know Jesus. And there were a lot of things like that that were not Catholic, but approached it. You know, the, we yeah. talked about the Lord's table. Every Wednesday, once a month on Wednesday night, we'd have the, um, the communion service. And the, and, and the pastor was very clear, because there were a lot of ex-Catholics there, this is not, you know, we don't believe this is, there's something mystical or Jesus physically present, um, but this is a very important moment. So he kind of tried to evoke a lot of emotion. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stirring of emotion. But at the end of the day, whether you felt something or not, you went on your way and just kind of yeah. forgot about it. And there was a lot of things like that that were, we really sort of, I began seeing defining ourselves by what we weren't. Yeah. You know, we weren't, we didn't have, we didn't have baptism. We didn't have, 
you know, the only real sacrament that we had was the word of God. That was the, in a sense that they wouldn't call it a sacrament, but it was, if there was one thing that was anointed, it was preaching, right? So you'd get the long, you know, 40 minute um, biblical exegesis, which was often very rich, but that was the moment because they believed that faith came through hearing the word of God, you know, so it was not through, um, you know, the, the life of the sacraments and, and so on and so forth. When you look back on those days, yeah. first for a period with the, the Plymouth Brethren, yeah. where you could kind of point to your awakening to faith. I'm guessing that's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. You had Catholic background, but your awakening came to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And then in that non-denominational independent church, during all that time, love for scripture, it's all based on scripture, it's the one sacrament, all of that. During any of that period, did the question arise, where did this thing come from? Did you ever think about where did this come from and why do we hold this with such authority? Yeah, if, if the question did in that early period, I didn't, I didn't let it ruminate and I didn't search out to try to find an answer. Maybe I thought, I don't know if there is an answer. I just would, if it came up at all, I maybe just quickly dismissed it. Once I actually got into... So, but no one from the pulpit no, never no told one, anybody? No. Never brought up? No. So it's interesting, once again, it's kind of, everything is kind of half of the story. Yeah. The, the Lord's Supper, half the story. It's not this part of it, but it's this part of it. The Why on Sunday or what day? Right. Well, this part, it's all kind of half of it. We're dedicating our kids. Well, something's got to be done, but it's not this part of it. Even scriptures, it's the Holy Inspired Word of God, but not where it came from. Right. Not the foundation of its authority. I can tell you when it began to really change. It wasn't so much going to Wheaton College, although it was, that put me in touch with history in a lot of ways for the audience that knows Wheaton. You know, it's an intellectual evangelical university that really prides itself on being invested in, uh, in Christianity in a in a robust intellectual way and committed to, to the, the history of Christianity. But um, I met a, a interesting like, guy who taught there was an Anglican. And he was no, you know, he wasn't leaning towards the Catholic faith, but he knew that I was grew, grown up Catholic. And he said, you know, you should probably get a catechism. It'd just be a good idea to, that would maybe help you just to kind of deepen your experience and kind of begin to systematize things. And, and as I did, I read the section on scripture, which took me back to a document I had no idea, I think it was called Dei Verbum. <laughs> and so I read Dei Verbum and it really rocked my world because the seeker movement that I was a part of insisted that there was a lot of Americans out there just like me who were searching and seeking after God. And yet the Bible itself says, there's no one who searches after God, right? No one seeks after God, ultimately talking about our, you know, situation. And, and Dei Verbum confirmed that. Dei Verbum laid out a vision of scripture and revelation that said, we don't simply seek after God and acquire a spirituality and arrive at him. It's he who comes to us. That's the whole, yeah. you read through the Vatican II and the tradition, and it's why we don't just call sacred scripture, sacred scripture, it's divine revelation, right? In fact, for the audience that may be unfamiliar with what we're talking about, Dei Verbum, is the Vatican II document on scripture and tradition. Right. Revelation, it's very short. You can easily read it in a half hour. Yeah. And I'm sure it's available at EWTN.com. You go online, you can get a copy of it all over the place. It's in the front of almost every Catholic modern yeah, Bible. Yeah, the Catholic Bible is probably It in is there. the book, the document to read to understand yeah. the Catholic view of Scripture, tradition, and authority yeah. and revelation. Yeah. George Weigel's got a new book out called Evangelical Catholicism, by which he means gospel Catholicism. And he makes a bold claim and says, of all the Vatican II documents, it may be the most, the most significant document of all because of the particular content of what's being talked about there. It's just, be yeah. just at the very root of it all. So reading that, I, it began to challenge my whole understanding that, well, we can kind of come to God on our own terms. And um, I think there's a lot of folks out there that are being uh, fed what I would call spirituality, which is sort of where you, you try this on, you try that on. Willow Creek used to say, come on in, we want you to be comfortable, relax, you know, we want you to be at ease. <laughs> well, you know, the Word of God itself is not often something that makes us comfortable. Yeah. Pope Benedict recently said, the Word of God is often a word that disrupts. It gets us out of that, those falsehoods, those, you know, and towards the truth itself. But that truth is a person, right? It's not simply a book. Uh, I like to say to my seminarians that, the, you know, uh, 
the scriptures contain the word of God. Now, it's not to say that we can pull apart what's human in there. That's not it. But that is to say that the scripture is the, in written form, the word of God, which itself is eternal. And that's what's beautiful is that it comes to us uh, and then is preserved through sacred tradition in the sacred scriptures. I had no idea about all of that. I had no idea about what is this thing we call sacred tradition, you know, this living transmission of the church. For people out there that are car guys or car gales, you know, what's a transmission? You can't drive a car without it, right? So it drives the car. And that sacred uh, tradition is that vehicle, if you will, that brings to us that apostolic deposit that Willow Creek actually said when they would read the apostles' teaching, right? Yeah. Little did we know that we actually were talking about something much more profound than the, the Bible itself. And that section in the catechism that you're professor was encouraging to read is, is a great summary of this continuity of the apostolic deposit through mm -hmm. tradition, orally and then the written. Right. You know, and again, I'm saying this for the sake of the audience, that that's a great place to start if right. you haven't looked into, even Catholics, you wonder where the scripture fits into right. tradition. Why do we believe it to be the authority behind our, our why faith? Why these 27 books in the New Testament and not other books? And how did that, what were the criteria? Who decided? All those were questions we didn't really engage in, not at the Brethren Church and not at Willow Creek. We're, we're busy raising our hands in the air and praising God and you know enjoying the fellowship with one another. But those were questions that we really left unanswered. And we're, for the most part, fine not answering them. When we get back, we'll take a break in a couple minutes. Well, I want to talk about the seven essential principles and some of these other things you're worrying about that you're working on. Before that, though, the ABCDs of Scripture that you were taught What's the good and the bad of that? I think there's a lot of good in it. I think first what's good about it is that I, for the first time in my life, was reading the scripture and talking about it and yeah. dialoguing about it. That is the big takeaway that was good. Um, it, it should not be that we're raising generations of Catholics that are somehow given a message, whether it's it's explicitly or just implicitly that that's just only something you do if and when you go to mass. This is actually our book and we can read it. And it doesn't take a PhD or an MDiv or anything like that to do so. We can talk about it, right? And we, certainly it helps to have someone who can have more confidence and understanding, like a pastor or de deacon or teacher or whatever. But that's the big thing. I think if there's a caution, though, it is we want to make sure as Catholics we're reading the Scripture from the heart of the church. Mm -hmm. And we can maybe talk more about right. that. Yeah. When we get back. Yeah. That, that really is the key. I mean, to a certain extent, if there's one message you want to give to every Catholic out there, and that is to not be afraid to open this Bible yeah, and to read it. And yeah, there are sections in the Old Testament where they can get bogged down or it sounds, how do I understand that in, right. in my culture today? But I mean, there really is no excuse to take some time to read from the beginning of Matthew to the end of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Just sit down and do it. Mm -hmm. A couple evenings, it's done. Mm -hmm. You could do it in a whole evening, but in, you know, a couple evenings, it ought to be done. Yeah. Because the danger is that we only hear it in snippets and pericopes this Sunday, then the next yeah. Sunday, the next Sunday, without the context of the whole book. And I would I just quickly want to put a plug in for the Old Testament and say that the church, Willow Creek, I was a part of, it kind of set aside for the most part the Old Testament. Every once in a while you pull out a psalm or something, but it set it aside as really sort of irrelevant. We've got the new. Yeah. And that's really modern Marcionism, right? setting aside the old. So I would say to Catholics that are listening too, at some point, maybe Lent or otherwise, don't be afraid to take at least a book of the Old Testament and go back. For example, you've got the, Scott Hahn's got the study Bible, right, right. for Genesis or Exodus. It w is, would be an amazing experience to go through that with a small group Bible study and to talk right. about and seeing how the old is, you know, revealed in the new and the new is hidden in the old, as Augustine said. But for many Catholics, I think, again, there's that fear. This is kind of a a difficult thing. We've got resources that can help with that. That was maybe the big flaw is that that church you were part of was trying to say that it was the continuity of Acts chapter 2. Right. But what it was ignoring is that Acts chapter 2 is the continuity of the people of God of the Old Testament. Correct. Correct. It's the direct, all the assumptions behind right. Acts chapter 2 are the continuity of the people of God of the Old Testament. Right. And the more that we can try to get in touch with the Old Testament, we begin to see the yearnings, the, the development, the, the yearnings for the Messiah, the promise that leads to Christ. It gives us the backstory, the context for understanding. When John uh, the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God, well, go back to Judaism and understand what the Lamb of God meant originally. And now we've got a whole new context for understanding that saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. when you were reading the early church fathers like Clement, 
you would realize that a third of Clement was quotes from the Old Testament right. as if that was the only scriptures they had. Yeah. And that was the, the foundation upon which their whole faith was right. built, was right. the Old Testament scriptures as fulfilled in the tradition of the church. And see, we were cut off from that too. In as, <clears throat> as, as Catholics, we didn't. I, I didn't have the context of the church fathers and certainly didn't get that either from uh, the megachurch experience. And he reads someone like Irenaeus yeah. in his biblical theology. Yeah. He had a Greek word in uh, against heresies, his book, here's a mouthful, anakaphaleosis, which uh, the catechism calls recapitulation. And by that, what he meant was, when you look at everything Christ does in the Gospels, it's an anakaphaleosis, or recapitulation, recapping of the Old Testament. So Jesus is the new Adam, he's the new Moses, he's the new Passover. Wow, now this gets, you want to talk about an exciting Bible study, read with Irenaeus's lens, and um, it's going to bring that continuity together in a way that is, can rock your world. All right, Dr. Smith, let's take a little break. We'll come back in a bit, and let's, we'll, we'll look at Turn. your seven essential pr principles for Catholic Scripture study. All right, right. see you a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Dr. Stephen Smith. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi. Uh, Stephen is what we call a revert, and really was scripture and early church fathers yeah. that kind of wakened you up. And then, of course, that's not what you do now. Right. You know, that, that's it. You've dedicated your life to that. And uh, this new book, The Word of the Lord, Seven Essential Principles for Catholic Scripture Study. I'm not going to do a bookmark on that. We'll save that for, yeah. good, for our good friend, Doug Keck. Hopefully, you'll have a chance to do that, to talk about that. But maybe the issue... And if the, if the, what's your website in case? Oh, somebody... it's, I have a website with biblical resources called thegodwhospeaks.com. Took it right from Benedict's language. <laughs> He's been saying this a lot lately. He wants to remind us, I think, and with good reason, that when we read scripture, what we're hearing is the God who speaks to us. And then he goes on and says, if that's true, says this in Verbum Domini, his document in scripture, if it's true that God speaks, then are we listening? And then also he turns that around to talk about prayer is where we, then we speak to him. So I've taken that kind of mantra from Benedict, the God who speaks .com is our website. So, yeah. Um, I think it was Father Thomas Dubay, who's well known to all the EWTM viewers, in some of his books has emphasized that one of the key uh, prerequisites for us to be able to hear God at the level at which we can hear God, whether it's through inspiration or through scripture, is really a, a, a function of humility. Hmm. So in that sense, um, I, I don't remember hearing much about that as a Protestant. I'm not going to say that's true, but I don't mm -hmm. remember that being. But it really is a big part of Catholic teaching, that to be open to the fullness of God, to hearing his word, to opening his word, to hearing it, studying it, one of the prerequisites is this growth in humility. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, it's hard to, to, to discern whether I'm hearing God or me. Right. I think that it, it reminds me of a, um, a saying uh, of Augustine. And he said, uh, I think it's in a letter that he writes actually to Jerome talking about, um, is the Bible true? And he says, you know, when you come across these, what we would call Bible difficulties, Augustine says there's really three possibilities when we see what appears to be something that's just not right. Number one, he said it could be the, the, the copy, 
You know, it could be a difficulty with the copy. Second thing he says is maybe it's the translation. But it's the third one that's of interest to me here. And he says, perhaps it is I who have erred. And so there's that humility. And I think that's a, a very important teaching for Catholics to consider that when we come across something that just doesn't make sense, um, to have that sense of humility to say, well, doggone it, that looks like an error to me. And you know, maybe there is an explanation. I just may not have it yet. But that, see, that presupposes uh, a, a grander idea in Catholic theology, and that is that Scripture is really God speaking to us. It really is God's Word, and that is clearly what we hold. Well, on this humility issue a little bit, I'd like to push on this a little yeah. bit, because did you find in your journey from Protestant Scripture study into a Catholic Scripture study, this issue of humility, in the sense that I seem to remember that there were times amongst Protestant scripture scholars, Bible thumpers, mm -hmm. that there was almost an arrogance, a pride, an assurance, a boldness yeah. to take this word and go out there, yeah. um, an overconfidence mm -hmm. that can, at the core, is a good sincerity, right. but it goes beyond, which needs the correction of this humility. Right. That and did you see that in your own journey? I did. I think there, um, you know, the scripture that comes to mind, especially, is uh, the Apostle Paul saying to Timothy, "All of Scripture is God breathed, Theos Nusos." Now that's a big part. If you look at Dei Verbum or any of our teachings on inspiration, it's right there. This idea that it's God breathed. But what's also there is the sense in a, a Protestant idea is that it kind of begins and ends there. So it's this book and this book alone. I remember I was, uh, after coming back into the church, I was listening to a Protestant program. Probably should have been listening to your program, which is not at the time, but I was listening to a Protestant scripture program, and it was okay. At the end of the program, the announcer comes on and he says, you know, that's right, uh, Pastor Ken, we'll see you next week. And just remember, the greatest news in the world, the greatest news in the world is that God gave us this book. And I nearly drove my car off the road when I heard that as a Catholic <laughs> because I thought, well, I love this book. But that's maybe putting a little bit too much confidence in the end-all, be-all of sacred scripture. And the Catechism reminds us we're not ultimately people of the book. We're people of God. We're people of Christ. The greatest news in the world, I would say, the correction would be, is Jesus Christ, right? The it, living Son. Or, you know, the arrogance of taking a verse like Acts chapter 2, what is it, 43 or whatever yeah. it is, you take that one verse and then you redefine a whole church movement out yeah. of it. Yeah. Or you take the Matthew passage, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, mm -hmm. and use that one passage to therefore justify any start of a church. I mean, the arrogance of right. that. And it becomes a selectiveness, too, so that what do you do with Matthew's gospel where Peter's declaration, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, or, or um, you know, you are uh, Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Whatever you bind in heaven is bound on earth, and so on. Well, we just kind of, we didn't do that one, you know? It just had too many rang of Catholicism, so we'd go What about it. the First Corinthians passage? Did you have any women teachers at your church? We did have women passage, uh, we, uh, were pastors. They, were their hairs, heads covered? Uh, they did not. So again, there's a parsing out there, right? You know, and um, the church was, had a very egalitarian perspective, which really rankled a lot of the more traditional Protestants who were there and saw a more complimentary view of men and women and more, more conservative. Here's the truth about Willow yeah. Creek for a moment. Although it said it was a church trying to take irreligious people and help turn them into fully devoted Christ followers, the reality was 70%, nearly 68% of the church was comprised of Catholics. 70%, Marcus. Yeah. And the other 30% mostly were what I would kind of call politely disgruntled Protestants that were kind of tired of their grandfather's version of Protestantism and liked the kind of new and, you know, let's take the next hill kind of, you know, uh, zeal of Willow Creek. Um, and so again, what you had was a kind of a very selective approach to the scriptures. You know, if this, this passage is problematic, we'll just steer away from it, you know. And if, you know, the, the head covering thing that Paul says, well, we're, we'll try to contextualize that. We're just kind of bury it, kind of. We're not going to talk about that. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, you need an authority behind an interpretation of something as important as the, how do you apply those right. passages 2,000 years later? Yeah. You know, what is the authority to change what Scripture says? Yeah. You know, so the church recognizes that the authority is because that written word is a part of a sacred tradition that's right. much bigger than just the written word. You'll get a kick out of this one. I remember uh, every so often they did a Q&A with the pastor and someone asked him one of these difficult questions. 
And I forget the question, but I'll never forget the answer. He said, you know, we're, just, we're gonna major on the majors and we're gonna minor on the minors. Meaning by that, well, we all agree about the big things that Jesus is the son of God <laughs> and so on. But I'm like, well, you just gave us a list of six or seven things that you call the majors, but kind of what gives you the right to decide what's major and what's minor? What's major to you and minor to someone else is actually major to, you know, just yeah. the opposite, or maybe both things are major. Yeah. How do we decide that? It seems like very much a human endeavor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, your book then. Um, of the seven principles you've got here, maybe one or so that you would say really points out maybe the uniqueness and the importance of scripture study from a Catholic perspective mm -hmm. versus the perspective that you had before. Yeah, really quickly, the first two I think are, are the fundamentals. The first one is that God's, sacred scripture is God's word, so inspiration and inerrancy, you talk about that. Now, the second one I can talk about is what I call the enfleshment principle. And the basic idea that Dave Verbum talks about is that we believe the scriptures are inspired, but we also believe that God used real human beings. It didn't drop from heaven. So we have to kind of um, be humble, as we talked about earlier, and recognize, well, these evangelists truthfully reported what Jesus said and did, but it's not like they were stenographers writing it down. That seems to give the human aspect of authorship a lot more freedom than some I think conservative fundamentalist types are uncomfortable with. They kind of prefer the God said it and that's it and I believe it, right? And so when you realize that Jesus Christ is the divine son but in human, human form, every way human accepts sin, you also have a model for understanding the scripture which is in every way it's a, a book that is divine but also human except error. So there's a relate, close relationship between how we understand our Lord Jesus Christ and how we understand the sacred scripture. If we simply make it a human book, we're missing the fact that it's God speaking to us. But if we only make it a divine book, we've got something very different than Christianity, that God really spoke through the prophets and the apostles in a human way, as Pope Benedict says. Yeah, the, so, yeah. The, this idea in the early days of the church when other books were arising, like the Gospel of Thomas, the question was, which, you know, which do we read in liturgy? That right. was the issue. Yeah. Which, which do we right. read in Mass? And the criteria was, well, which ones go back to a Church of the Apostle? Yeah, that's right. It, it really is apostolic succession that's the undergirding of why these books are here. Right. Because it goes back to a Church of an Apostle. Right. The, the one thing I'd add I think is really important about this second idea, this enfleshment idea, is as I say, there's no bypassing the apostles. It's sort of like you don't get the Bible from God to our hands, right? As if there's an end around. And I think that's what is the component that's often missing in this um, mega church and largely Protestant experience. Is it's sort of like it goes from God to your hands. You don't really need that human um, uh, small and mediator in the sense that they're transmitting it, the apostles. But that's not how it worked in the early church, right? It was the word of God came to the apostles in oral form, as you said earlier, and then in written form. So we rely upon those sources, the apostles. We trust them. We can't live without their teaching. And I think that's an important starting point for Catholics to realize, okay, whenever you're reading the scripture, it's not disconnected from the church. In fact, the scriptures came from the heart of the church in the first place. And that's a good question for our Protestant brothers and sisters who say, well, I've, I've got my Holy Bible here. Well, how did that come together? It was the process of living transmission, the apostolic tradition, the sacred tradition that gave us this thing that we call sacred scripture from the, the hand of God. The, uh, the Protestant scholar who's been pushed on that many, many times, and his conclusion was that what we end up with is a, a fallible list of infallible books. Right. And in the end, if you really get into it from a Protestant perspective, that's where you end up. And you can't go very far beyond that. Because as soon as you hit the fallible list, it's because you want to deny the authority behind well, the, the, the bishops that gathered to make this list. That's right. Which gave it the inspirational authority guided by the Holy Spirit. Right. Otherwise, you know, you're left with, an, like I said, a fallible list. Yeah. Which is scary for someone to actually say that because he's saying there might be some other book out there somewhere we don't have on our list. That's right. Different. You know, or maybe one in, eh, no, we're pretty yeah, sure, yeah, but yeah, it yeah. just opens a can of worms. I got an email of Travis from West Virginia. I would love to go deeper in my faith and think that I would benefit from reading more of the scripture. Mm -hmm. Is there a good way to start? 
I'm not sure how helpful it would be for me to pick up a Bible and start reading from Genesis on. Yeah. The most read book verse in the Bible, right? Genesis 1. It is. It is. Often what happens, I think, is people on their own start with good intentions reading, say, beginning in Genesis. They get into Leviticus and like, oh boy, maybe I made a mistake here. No, you didn't make a mistake, but maybe coming at it from a different approach. Um, look, I think there's more than one way to, to skin this cat, but I would say, first, don't. Tr I'm, I'm glad that you're feeling this way, but don't try to do it on your own. Um, I would say a good first stop might be to your local church. And first, see if there might be already something going on at the church, a Bible study that you can join into. A lot of times uh, there are programs happening uh, throughout the year that you can jump in on. And if not, maybe a neighboring pair. So that would be a, a good first start. A second thing I would say is uh, invest in a catechism. I really wish I had that catechism with me early on in my own journey because if you go to the section of the catechism that talks about the mysteries of Christ's life and just read those for a couple of months, it would enliven your Bible study greatly, tremendously. I'll give you one example. There's a couple of paragraphs in the catechism that say all of Christ's life is filled with three mysteries. Revelation, by which it means truth being conveyed in any passage of the Gospels. Redemption, that means every aspect of Christ's life is redemptive. And then this idea I mentioned earlier, recapitulation, making the old new again. I told my seminarians, I was a little skeptical when I read that in the catechism. They can't mean every passage in the Gospels. And then I start reading them. You know, read the baptism of Christ, read the wedding feast of Canaan, read any passage. And you can see that what the catechism puts together for us there is a reliable and sure Wait, it's not a method, it's not a principle, but it's an approach that says you can read it from the heart of the church. So now try it. Take those three ideas from the catechism and take any passage and say, what do I see being revealed here in this passage? The baptism of Christ is an easy one in a sense because you can read the passage and say, well, many things are revealed, the divinity of Christ, the Trinity, the Father, right, the Father's voice, the Son in the water and the Holy Spirit coming down on him. Go to the next one, redemption. Well, that one sounds kind of interesting. I brought a prop along. I picked this up in uh, Jerusalem. I, we take our seminarians every, uh, every um, Christmas time to Jerusalem for about 18 days. It's exciting. And this is an Orthodox uh, cross of blessing, it's called. And uh, I had a hard time buying it because the guy said, well, you're not Orthodox, you're a priest. <laughs> I said, well, I promise not to do anything you know, radical with it, let me buy it. And anyways, on the cross of blessing, on one side, you can see, if your audience can see it, it's got the baptism of Jesus Christ. And on the back side of it is the crucifixion scene. Well, how are those two things connected? Well, you got the beginning of Christ's ministry in the end. But when you read the Gospels, Jesus puts baptism in a context that sometimes we miss, which is it's put in the context of his death, right? He says to the apostles in Mark 10, you know, he talks about his, his death as a baptism in his blood. Paul says, unless you're, you die with Christ, we don't rise with him, right? The death and resurrection is put in the context of baptism going down in the waters. So you could take the catechism then and say, there's something redemptive happening in baptism, right? And then you can take the last idea from the catechism, uh, recapitulation, and have all kinds of fun, go back to the beginning of creation and the waters of creation and Jesus stepping into the Jordan. Just a little example, but my point is, you're not doing that on your own anymore. You've got the catechism to give you some, some insights. And I would say, if you can't join a Bible study, and if you can't, don't have the wherewithal to start one, at least make that journey with the catechism, because when you do so, you're going to be reading it from the heart of the church in a way that may unlock and show you more of Scripture. Yeah, of course, part of the beauty today is the internet. Yeah. There's some parts of the internet you want right. to stay away from, yeah. but there is some yeah. resources on the internet where and you actually you, can be involved with others right. reading the Scripture together. That's right. And you've got a great resource with this, read the catechism Scripture through a year, right? right? And so that's another way of going about it, just to get some accountability going. But yeah, yeah. Praise God, we've got a lot of good resources. Thanks for today. that little plug. If anybody's interested at the Coming Home Network website, chnetwork.org, you can go there and you can get the guide to read the Bible with the catechism in 15, 20 minutes a day, you're done in a year. Right. Just do it. And, and you can do that every day for the rest of your life. In fact, I would encourage somebody to take a, a bit of scripture, a bit of the catechism every day for the rest of your life. And the Holy Spirit will bless your life with it. Absolutely guaranteed. Yeah. Absolutely guaranteed. Another email, Jesse from Norfolk. After being a part of a mega church, is there anything that Steve believes that Catholics should take from them to make our church life more dynamic? Yeah, the one thing I would say to really caution um, your viewers, Marcus, is to think that what we want to do is look at the measure of, quote, success of these churches, say, well, how do we import that? And sometimes people, when I tell them my story, they say, well, 
it's really exciting and it sounds interesting what's going on there. Maybe we should kind of try to replicate some of these things. And I would say, you know, time, time out, yeah. big red flag there. Um, what I think I've discovered, though, is let's say you've got a couple Catholic parents listening to the program. They've got a teen who's kind of bored going to church. This is a similar situation as I was, I was in. I would say, first of all, are you having conversation with them in your family about, not necessarily about the scriptures, but about the whole Catholic thing? Right? Are you talking to them about it? What's difficult? What do you like? What, just to kind of get into their interiority to see if it's first of all there and what's not. Secondly, um, reminding your kids of what the purpose of church is. We go there to be fed by Christ. And so if you say, well, Mass is boring this morning. Well, but we, we did receive our Lord in the, in the Eucharist, right? I have a good friend in Chicago who's a priest who tells me when he was back in seminary, he almost left seminary because he was going through a time of turmoil. He walked into a mass seeking some solace and there was like a 94-year-old priest up there. And it was just one of those masses where it was just not the most enticing and the music kind of, I think he said the priest fell asleep in the middle of the homily. It was just a disaster on a human sense. But then he said, all kidding aside, he realized, hey, what am I here for? I'm here to be met by love, to be met and encountered by Jesus and receive him. And once we get back to that basic fundamental idea of what worship is, of being re received by love and giving that love back to Christ in worship in the Eucharist and with the word of God, then it begins to lift some of that burden of it's never going to be perfect this side of heaven, right? One last thing I would say is a lot of young Catholics leave the Mass because they don't have that connection to either the catechesis and so on, but also because there is something about being stirred in our hearts. So you know what I would say to parents? Don't be afraid to mix it up every now and then. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in supporting the neighborhood parish, absolutely. But if you have a listener in, for example, New York, I would say, you know, take them once or twice a year to a Mass with Cardinal Dolan, you know, if you can afford it, take them to Rome. I mean, those are things to show your kids the excitement, the universality, right? The, the, the grandeur of Catholicism, we can lift out of that everyday experience. Then when you come back to that, you take those experiences with you into the ordinary, right? Into the daily mass. You mentioned something earlier about the importance of beauty. That is, is one thing that seems to be less appreciated in these uh, create your own aspects. But what is the, the essence of beauty in the Catholic Church that you want to point out to them? Yeah. Well, it's many things. Certainly, we, we see it when you walk into the cathedral. I mean, my daughter, who is four, uh, we were at Mass, and she was a little distracted on Sunday. At, uh, and so my wife was just giving her catechesis by letting her walk around and look at the stained glass windows and the stories that are in yeah. within them, right? Um, no, it's really very sad to me that a number of Catholic churches have kind of deconstructed that classical idea of beauty, even the way we look up in a large, say, yeah. Gothic cathedral, right? And the, the kind of flattening of them. Um, I have an interesting story to tell you. I was in uh, California this summer and visited Thomas Aquinas College, and they have this beautiful chapel there. You may have heard, some of your viewers may have heard about it. It's called uh, Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. And I understand that uh, the actor Anthony Hopkins uh, was driving by, and I don't know what his spirituality is, but um, I know he's not a Catholic, and yet he saw from the road this magnificent, I mean, your viewers can Google later, uh, uh, structure, architectural, it looks like a trade out of the, you know, 16th century. And you walk in and it's just a glorious, I mean, you're, you're brought up to heaven in every way. Well, what attracted him there? You know, it wasn't a, a theater seat or it wasn't a, you know, a video screen or a rock band that could replicate, you know, U2 or something in a worship song. It was something that was uh, drawing him heavenward that reminds us uh, as G.K. Chesterton might say, that every moment is preparing us for our true home. And that's what beauty really is. It's an encounter with grace. It's an encounter with Jesus, and it, it ought to be. So we don't need to be ashamed of, you know, the, uh, what some consider the opulence of the church. I had a guy say to me once, you know, why does the church have all these riches and wealth and treasures? I said, well, you know, that's for everyone to enjoy. So it's for everyone to experience the rich, the poor, and everyone in between. Imagine if you had nothing and come in and worship in such a grandeur that points us heavenward. What a gift, what a great gift. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is true that uh, Bonaventure and Flannery O'Connor in their writings both point out that you could be in the midst of, of an area where there's no beauty from a human perspective. It could be the, the other, the most poverty-stricken area, yet if your heart and mind are attuned, 
you can see the vestige of God there. You can see the beauty if you're looking at it through the eyes of God. You know, you're looking at, a, as Mother Teresa would see Christ mm -hmm. in the poorest of the poor. So you don't have to have the opulence. But yet, the beauty of this great cathedrals was not about the earthly opulence. Right. It was to draw, again, people upwards to see the vestiges mm -hmm. of God in beauty, to and train I us so that we could see it in the midst of poverty and therefore act as Christ would to those people. You know, Marcus, and I would encourage Catholic parents to maybe consider this Lent or whenever, having a conversation with their kids about what I call the catechesis of the cross. And that is to say, you know, the, the Willow Creek Church believed that the cross was simply, I can hardly say, just one symbol of Christianity that could be dispensed with and, you know, break down all these barriers to bring in the seekers. But for us Catholics, and for many Protestants too, I think, the crucifix is this image, the central image and sign of Christ's beautiful love for us, right? It's not an image of torture, it's an image of oblation, of, of Christ's giving his whole self to us. When we take that away and look at simply the empty cross, we say, well, maybe the resurrection, but we're beginning to again lose that incarnational faith that we've been talking about in many ways this whole hour. And I think that's what's really at stake that concerns me in this larger megachurch movement is it's kind of moving away from an incarnational model, whether we're talking about baptism or the sacraments or the word of God or the crucifix itself. Is it's an encounter with the beautiful Christ in all the stages of the spiritual life. Another email, Lauren from San Jose. A friend of mine is a fallen away Catholic who is fairly bitter about Catholicism. She always tells me that Catholics do this and that and believe in things that aren't in the Bible. I know that isn't quite right, but need to know how to give her a satisfying response to her concerns. That's a really good question. I would say, first of all, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that if there are wounds there, however, we want to bring them beyond that to truth or you know apologetics or facts and help clear up the picture. We have to begin by acknowledging the human pain. If someone's had a lousy experience because it's been lousy, then we can acknowledge that. Um, but we don't want to leave them there, right? So I think it's important to be a good listener, to be compassionate, and uh, to, to offer a certain amount of empathy for the experience. Um, I go out and give talks to engaged couples, many of whom are often I, I imagine far from the church, and I often say, if you've had a bad experience of Catholicism because you've been wounded or hurt by someone, then please allow me to apologize as a member of the church for that experience. It's just a starting point to say, I'm really sorry about that, to, offer, to, to yeah. think about forgiveness. But then we can talk about um, the, the, uh, the fact that the church is always, right, the wheat and the, and the chaff, that there's always a sense mm -hmm. in which until heaven, we're going to see within the church both saints and sinners as a reality of it. We're not going to experience this side of heaven, that perfection of the kingdom of God. And to maybe bring a little bit of sobriety back to it and say, I'm sorry you've been hurt, but also to realize we're going to experience that dynamic in the church because we're dealing with humanity as well. But then also maybe if we can, lastly, to try to clarify and clean up some of those difficulties. I have a good friend in, in Chicago who left his Catholic faith because someone said, well, where is it saying the Bible that you can't eat meat on Friday? He went back and tried to find it and got frustrated. So, well, okay, maybe you're right. And that and 10 other things caused him to kind of begin to kind of unhinge from the church. But if he could understand something about sacred tradition or that abstinence, meeting, eating meat on Friday, while a beautiful thing is not sacred tradition with a capital T. The catechism says, paragraph 83, you can, um, that there are local and regional liturgical disciplinary traditions, small t, that can be dispensed with and even discarded over time. Shocking to hear that, but for some who think everything is all part of the whole, you know, sacred you know, mystagogical thing and you can't change it, well, you now the church is saying there we have to discriminate. So that clarification could help to say, look, here are some things over time that, uh, that do change. You know, for example, women years ago wearing head coverings. I know many um, older Catholics who still do, and God bless them, yep. but that's one of those traditions like abstinence and so on that can be dispensed with over time. But what we can't dispense with is that apostolic kerygma, right? The preaching Christ, the teaching of Christ, the creeds, the dogmas, and that's what we are certainly hold dear and profess as Catholics. It, it, maybe it's because even... Uh, us Catholics can somehow either forget or be blind to the reason behind these disciplines. 
I mean, what's, what's, why is the church doing any of these things? Mm -hmm. It's so that we can grow in holiness. Mm -hmm. That's the core, is that in following Jesus, mm -hmm. we are to be more like him. And those who have, have gone before us have recognized that fighting against the nature that we have needs disciplining right. so that we can grow in holiness. Right. And I think what we don't want to do is distill or water down or move away from those Catholic traditions either. I'll give you another good example is the rosary. I think Mary is remains for many Protestants a big stumbling block. Um, I, uh, I just finished a series on the biblical mysteries of the rosary, have it on my website. And it's to show Catholics and really anyone who's interested that the rosary really is a biblical prayer. All right. With that note, I encourage you to read, read the rosary or pray the rosary. Thank you for joining us. God bless, Marcus. Thanks so much. It's good to have you here. And God bless you. Look forward to being with you again next week.